Good morning, everyone. Russ Barkley here with another review of research published during the week of June the 30th. Uh, some of you have been asking about uh, what's the name of the nursing home where I get my hair cut. That's a trade secret, so perhaps I'll reveal that later. Uh, but back to more serious matters, let's take a look at what was in the news this week. The first article I want to point out uh, is an editorial uh, in the British Medical Journal, which uh, deals with balancing access to ADHD medication with the need to constrain certain aspects of prescribing of Schedule II potentially addictive substances. Uh, basically, it reviews a variety of reasons why we here in the U.S. and other countries as well have been experiencing a shortage of ADHD medication, specifically Adderall and most recently uh, Vyvanse, which is a patented form of amphetamine like Adderall in the way that that medication gets delivered into the body. But nonetheless, we're seeing some shortages of medication, and this has been going on for quite some time. So this editorial goes through uh, all of the complex reasons why this shortfall has occurred. It isn't simply because there's been a rise in diagnosis since the pandemic, though that is true. Uh, it isn't simply the fact that for a while, at least in the US, during the pandemic, physicians were allowed to prescribe these medications using telemedicine rather than in-person patient-related care where they could do a more thorough evaluation and write a prescription. Uh, in addition to that, we saw during the pandemic that there was a lot of new clinics and private practice opening up that were doing online, very quick assessments of ADHD and diagnosing people and even prescribing for people uh, during that time. And that also led to an increase in diagnosis, in treatment seeking, and in medication prescription. Uh, finally, here in the US, there's also uh, the issue that we have the Drug Enforcement Administration, which sets limits on how much medication can be produced by companies during a given year. And when that medication gets used up, it can be very difficult to get that quota increased in a timely manner in order to address the shortfall. So there's many other reasons discussed in this editorial, but if you're curious as to why this shortfall has occurred and whether or not it's gonna be resolved relatively soon, probably not, uh, then have a look at this editorial. Uh, again, all articles that I discuss in this weekly review are listed in the thumbnail sketch <clears throat> along with the hot link over to where you can find the article. I don't provide links to all articles that are listed in the thumbnail sketch because I don't discuss all of them. But the few I do discuss, I do provide you with the link so you can go read the article as well. So you might want to have a look at this editorial if that's been a concern of yours. Uh, and by the way, just again, I'll say it, I've said it before, I do not review published dissertations or theses because they're not published in journals and they're not peer reviewed. So maybe eventually they will be, but when I find those, I don't put them in this research review. And again, I also don't review any of the research going on um, on animal models of ADHD either. So with that disclaimer in mind, uh, let's move on and take a look at what was a very interesting meta-analysis that was published this week, interesting to me anyway, because it deals with something that most people don't even think about, and that is whether or not ADHD is associated with a higher rate of primitive reflexes that sustain longer into development than they should have. Uh, in other words, they're not becoming integrated in the newborn during their first year or so of development as well as they are in typical people. This topic has been discussed going back as long as 30 to 40 years ago when research showed that kids with ADHD had a number of unusual or immature reflex patterns that suggested an immature maturation of the nervous system. So here's an interesting review on the uh, tonic neck reflex, both symmetric and asymmetric. I'm gonna define that for you in just a moment, um, but let's go over the results of the review, first of all, because they were looking at the occurrence of this phenomena 
uh, that is this late maturation of the tonic neck reflex in kids with ADHD. <clears throat> And it's a meta-analysis, which means that it went out and it searched the journals to try to find as many articles as they could in order to include them uh, in this research meta-analysis. In this case, they found four articles, totaling a sample of about 229 uh, individuals, and they were able to include those in the meta-analysis. And what they, they find, results showed a significant positive and moderate connection between ADHD and primitive reflexes, particularly for the asymmetric tonic neck reflex. They go on to point out that this appears to suggest that ADHD is associated with a delay in the maturational integration of these primitive infant reflexes uh, in individuals with ADHD compared to typical young children. So uh, there's no evidence here that suggests any sort of a causal relationship that needs to be uh, explored. I'm not sure how you would do that. You're certainly not going to induce these conditions. Uh, and it may well have to do with the genetics of ADHD being related to problems with the gray matter and white matter development of the frontal and prefrontal lobes of the brain. We know that those areas are associated with ADHD. We know that that is the executive brain and that it helps with our executive functioning and self-regulation, but parts of the frontal lobe are also involved in motor development. Uh, so this just may be one more sign about delayed cortical and subcortical maturation being a feature of ADHD. Now, if you're not familiar with these primitive reflexes, uh, here is a article on Healthline, which I've also put into the thumbnail sketch, uh, that discusses these various reflexes and why uh, young infants have them. They basically have some survival value, uh, and some of that pertains to this particular tonic neck reflex as well. So if you'll scroll down this article at Healthline, you'll see that they discuss the palmer grass, which is if you touch your baby's hand, it grass. That obviously has survival value for infants. The plantar reflex, uh, you've also got the sucking reflex. If you tickle the cheek or put something near the lips, the individual starts to suck on it. The rooting reflex, if you again touch the cheek, the individual starts to root around for their mother's nipple uh, or other food sources. Uh, and then there was a variety of other ones here, the startle reflex and so on. The one that we're interested to hear are, or excuse me, the two we're interested to hear are the tonic neck reflexes, the asymmetric and the symmetric. And you can read more about them, but the asymmetric knee, uh, excuse me, tonic neck reflex um, is the one that some people refer to as the fencer's reflex. If you turn your baby on their side, okay, and you rotate their head, excuse me, put the baby on the back, turn the baby's head to one side, you will see that the infant uh, extends its arm and its leg on one side and pulls its arm and its leg up on the other. That's known as the asymmetric neck reflex. Uh, and it develops actually very early in utero. Look at this. It's been going on since 35 weeks gestation. So uh, it arises very early, and it is thought to help to integrate movement in the body and also to allow the infant to move the upper part of the body and the lower part of the body separately from each other, at least eventually. Um, but in the beginning, you can get this kind of an asymmetric neck reflex, uh, especially after the baby is born. And as it says here, by three months of age, this reflex should have disappeared. And then there's the symmetric tonic neck reflex, uh, which is where if you move the baby's head back and forward, you will see the baby extend and contract its arms and its legs simultaneously, hence the word symmetric. So again, these are important reflexes. Some think that they may have to do with helping the baby negotiate the passage through the birth canal, but certainly after birth may have to do with simply beginning to integrate these primitive reflexes uh, into a coordinated pattern, and then they tend tend to disappear over the next three to nine months, depending upon which of these neck reflexes we're talking about. But once again, this article suggests that <clears throat> 
ADHD is associated with a delay in the integration of these reflexes. So uh, I just thought that was fascinating to me as a scientist. Haven't seen much on this for the last couple of decades. People kind of moved on after it was sort of noted back in the 70s and 80s. But here's a, a meta-analysis on that. <clears throat> Excuse me. The next article I want to talk about, um, in a sense, related to uh, pregnancy. So this is hypertensive disorders that occur during pregnancy and around the time of delivery in the mother that may produce some risk for neurodevelopmental disorders and epilepsy. Once again, this is a meta-analysis. It's pu published in the journal Pregnancy Hypertension, uh, and it is a review of all of the research that was found on the relationship of preeclampsia, which is a form of hypertension uh, that is uh, seen during pregnancy, uh, and uh, risk for ADHD, autism, and so on. So as the article says here, scrolling down, preeclampsia is one of the most common perinatal conditions, affects about 2 to 8% of all pregnancies worldwide. Uh, it's a multi-organ disease, which means that this hypertension begins to create an adverse in utero environment that can have long-lasting effects on the offspring's cognitive, cardiovascular, physical, and even psychological health and development. Uh, the association of preeclampsia and cardiovascular health, health is well described in the literature, as it says. And reading on, it says that there is some conflicting evidence as to whether this form of hypertension uh, is associated with risk for ADHD, autism, and epilepsy, hence the reason they do the meta-analysis. And what does the meta-analysis find? Uh, it finds that there were six studies that looked at preeclampsia and risk for ADHD. If we summarize those together, there was an increased risk of about 30%. That's what that odds ratio means there. Uh, so 0.29, roughly 0.3 increase in risk if preeclampsia was present and ADHD was a later outcome. There were eight studies that looked at this risk with autism. They also found about a 27% uh, increase in risk. And then there were three that looked at the risk for epilepsy, and they found about a 35% increase in risk of epilepsy in the offspring if preeclampsia had occurred during the pregnancy or around the perinatal time of delivery. Uh, so again, just another risk factor that might be associated with development of ADHD that could be having adverse effects on neurological development that give rise to neurodevelopmental disorders. But as the author, authors also point out at the end here, uh, these results to their knowledge, <clears throat> while quantifying the risk of preeclampsia with these later conditions, also point out that this could just be a marker for preterm birth because we know that preeclampsia is often associated with prematurity of birth, and we have a well-established relationship between significant prematurity and risk for ADHD going forward. So preemie babies, for instance, have been found to have a risk of anywhere from 25 to 45% for later ADHD if their prematurity was sufficient to warrant placement in a neonatal intensive care unit. So again, a meta-analysis I thought I would draw to your uh, attention. Finally, <clears throat> here was an interesting article that's comparing uh, a dose of methylphenidate to a single dose of this transdermal cortical stimulation. This is a relatively new treatment that investigators have been playing around with. It's where you take a single diode and you place it somewhere on the skull and it transmits a low uh, current uh, into the brain and it's believed that this kind of transdermal conduction uh, into the brain <clears throat> may alter brain functioning in a way that is therapeutic. And it's been tried with depression and other disorders. Uh, and here's a study that was published uh, in uh, the Frontiers in Neuroscience that was a small scale study that took 26 children and adolescents with ADHD. And then some of them were given methylphenidate only. Uh, some of them were given a single session of this TDCS treatment, right? Uh, and <clears throat> others weren't given anything. And they compared these groups 
to each other uh, to see whether or not the uh, TDCS treatment was as effective as medication. Uh, and the answer is no, it wasn't. Uh, their protocol showed that a single dose of methylphenidate helped to improve measures of working memory, uh, as well as you see here, inhibitory control, uh, and that it was superior to the TDCS, which did not show any effect on these aspects of executive functioning uh, in these children. So it doesn't look like this kind of treatment is going to be particularly beneficial, even though it's non-invasive. Um, and I've seen other studies uh, that had mixed results, but the better the study, uh, the more likely that it used a sham treatment for the TDCS treatment, <clears throat> the less likely they were to get any benefits from that particular treatment. So uh, if that's of interest to you, have a look at that article in our research uh, review thumbnail sketch. So uh, thanks for joining me, everybody. Uh, and given my dress, I guess I'm off to clean up highways as part of the local prison crew. Uh, but that said, uh, join me again next week for another research review. Thanks for watching and be well.